out of sight, out of view from others. But here's the amazing thing. God makes us clean. And it's not by our efforts. All that we try to do, the scrubbing, the hiding, God makes clean in an instant. We can work as hard as we want, but God does it by His grace and mercy. What, he, what I love about God is He does more than we can ask or think. God doesn't just show you what you need to turn away from, but He also shows you what you need to turn to. He takes you past yourself, past your problems, and He brings you to Him. God doesn't focus on our sins only, and thankfully that's the case. Um, but God is about showing you how to turn away and where to turn to. And this is important, and I want us to get it. Psalm 49.15 says, But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. You'd think I picked that verse on purpose. <laughs> but God. So, it would be one thing to forgive sin. I might sin against someone. And they could forgive me. But I'm still a sinner. I sinned. I, I maybe stole from someone. I'm still a thief. Even if they forgive me, I still committed that act. And just because they forgive gave me doesn't mean that what I did is gone and forgotten. But it's a whole nother ball game with God. When you're reconciled, God says, I forgive. And I remember your sins no more. Wow. I've sacrificed my son, so now come. Come to me, my redeemed and spotless one. And I just, that, that's amazing. I think if our salvation was just about forgiveness, God could have done something different than send Jesus to die. But it's more than that. Jesus is about forgiveness, the death of sin, and the redemption of humanity to treasure and enjoy and worship God. If it was just about forgiveness, then I think God probably could have just forgiven us. But He wanted to do more. He wanted us to have relationship with Him. He wanted us to be blameless and to be truly close to Him. Propitiation, redemption, forgiveness, sanctification, liberation, healing, even heaven. None of these realities mean anything if we don't treasure God. These realities, like forgiveness and sanctification, they're to bring us to God. They're to make us enjoy Him and Him alone forever. The gospel is meant to get people to God, not anything else. The gospel is not meant to get us heaven. It's not meant to get us a good feeling or a spiritual high, but it's to get God. Another great example of a but God and how he doesn't just focus on our sin but brings us to himself is in Jonah. Uh, bear with me. This is another story that's probably overtaught in Sunday school and kids just remember a whale swallowing a man. But it's actually so much more. And we'll start with Jonah chapter 4, but first I want to give you the Luke's condensed version. <laughs> So Jonah is told by God to go to Nineveh and warn them of their sin. But he doesn't want to because he hates them. The Ninevites are part of the Assyrian Empire, and the Assyrians and the Jews were always at odds. And so the Bible says that Jonah decided to flee to Tarshish. Say it with me, Tarshish. It's <laughs> a terrible word. Um, uh, so we're not exactly sure where Tarshish is. Uh, some say that it might be as far as Spain, even. And within the Bible, it typically is just referring to a far-off place, a place that you have to only you can only reach by boat. So Jonah is headed there. He's fleeing there. He's fleeing from the Lord. Now to quickly understand the situation. Jonah gets on a boat in the Mediterranean Sea, bound for Tarshish, and Nineveh is the opposite direction. It's inland. It's not on the sea at all. It's like Jerusalem and Israel or whatever are about 1,500 miles 
away from Nineveh. So that's, that's like a 21 hour drive. Um, and Spain is even farther. If that's where it was, Spain is even farther. And so he's fleeing in the complete opposite direction. He wanted to be as far away from Nineveh as possible. He hated them, and he wanted God's wrath on them. So that was a bit of a sidetrack, but it's just to give a little perspective. So he's running this way, and he should have been going this way. So he's in the boat, storm comes, uh, the crew on the boat blame him, he gets thrown overboard. Uh, he's overboard, a whale, well, a large fish, we don't know exactly what it was, swallows him. And he's there for a few days, and while he's there, in the belly of this fish, he repents and he calls out to God. And it's actually a really good prayer. It's in Jonah chapter 2. But the fish then spits him up. God hears his cries, fish spits him up. And as he's on dry land again, he hears the voice of the Lord, and he goes to Nineveh. He actually complies. The Ninevites repent and turn to God. And this is where we'll pick up the story. It's in Jonah chapter 4. Jonah gets really angry because God shows mercy on them. And Jonah says in chapter 4, verse 2, This is why I was fleeing to Tarshish, because I knew you would be gracious and merciful, God. And since that's the case, please just kill me. It's a little overdramatic, but that's a little bit. it shows how much he disliked these people. So, in his annoyance, Jonah goes outside of the city and just sits down. Hoping, I think, maybe that God's wrath would still come. I don't know. So he's sitting there, and God appoints actually a plant to grow up over him, and it gives him shade, and Jonah is so happy with this plant. But the next day, God sends a worm to eat and destroy the plant. So now we're in verse 8. So the plant has been destroyed. Verse 8. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Verse 9. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right from their left and also much cattle? So how is this story relevant to my point? Uh, here we see Ephesians 2 playing out in the Old Testament. Here we see God's exceeding grace and rich mercy, not just to Nineveh, but also to Jonah. Jonah's disobedience and his anger, they're not the point of the story, but they play a crucial part. But ultimately, this story shows us that God is in the business of bringing others to an understanding of himself, and most importantly, to himself. And the Lord said, you pity the plant. What did he mean by that? Verse 9 said, Jonah was angry about the plant dying. But why? This worm had attacked it and killed him, and the plant had made Jonah really happy. So do you see what God's doing here? He's actually, by destroying the plant, he's actually helping Jonah to see that his pity for the plant pales in comparison to God's pity for Nineveh. He says, you pity the plant, should I not pity Nineveh? He's basically saying to Jonah, your priorities are whack, bro. You need to see the big picture. You need to understand that there are souls that need saving. And you're worried about a plant that you did nothing to create. And yet, here are people made by God, made by me, sustained by me, and even their livestock used for food or commerce or whatever they were used for, and they'll all perish if it was not for the mercy of God. Mm -hmm.